Hey guys and gals, welcome to part two of our interview with Dori Kaimi. If you haven't heard part one yet, make sure to go back and check that one out. Also, just a note, we were dealing with some connection problems with this interview, so the audio might not be quite at the standard we're used to. But regardless, I think we got a great interview out of this. So once again, here's the great Brazilian composer and arranger, Dori Kaimi. Well, Hayden, I, I was just going to let you ask a few more questions because uh, of the musical side. So I don't know if you want to just continue on and just let, you know, your old man sit back and watch <laughs> yeah, you do you it. Got, you got a break this time? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so so one question I thought of actually, uh, based on what you were saying before, I feel like it's it seems a bit more rare now for musicians and, and arrangers to really specialize in one thing and really perfect it now i feel like often people are told to to kind of go wider and be able to do many things just because of the nature of the music industry now but with your experience over the years like do you think the work that you took on like helped define your style or were you did you, you have you always kind of had a specific style in mind that you've been trying to go after and yeah i told you my school of music was was brazilian music mm -hmm. and american music basically but i listened to classical because i'm a big dbc and, and ravel mm -hmm. right i think those guys in my my love for for music and uh but i always had the something in my in my uh, beauty beauty and and it's like a, when i think orchestra i never think in something that is going to work with the purpose of sell or albums or and i'm a so i'm not, I'm not a very good pop guy you know so i work with many times and uh, i appreciate the many many players in the united states uh, but but my vision was always uh, to follow my principles, and I, I don't think I changed at all. You know, it's, I, I think it's getting worse. You know, <laughs> I always loved the aesthetics of the painters, the, the reality of Brazilian writers. Serious, like the Amado, George Amado, you know. So my music is always based in uh, compositions in terms. It's very the way that I play guitar. I I try to be Brazilian all the time, it, and and it's. I don't think it's, it's you know it's work the other way because I don't know how to play the other way. You know, right. it's like if you ask me to play some jazz or. You know, I love jazz, but I can't, can't, I cannot play jazz. You know, so I love to listen to, mm -hmm. listen to my my entire life. So, and the orchestrators basically, except those two Canadians that I spoke <laughs> about it, <laughs> uh, it's American music. It's it's you know, since the the, the arranger like Axel Stordhal for Frank Sinatra in the in the forties, in you know. And uh, guys, uh, Wellington, and you go to Mancini and, and Johnny Mandel, that became my ballad guy. You know, it's like a, I, I loved him. It's just passed away, but for me, it's going to be still the guy, Johnny Mandel. Mm -hmm. I know, I know, if, I don't know if you know him, but he, he wrote uh -huh. The Shadow First The Shadow First Mile. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he wrote, you know, and uh, the the Mona Lisa album of Tali uh, Cole. He wrote the arrangements for this this album, basically the arrangements. So if you hear him, it's it's so poetic in terms of music. It's so it's big heart, you know. And so I I think he was my guy. Mancini, I, you know, it was in the beginning was, and then you have Quincy Jones as a ranger, 
and uh, Ted Jones. And so I always uh, loved this. So if you ask me, I'm a Brazilian composer that loves classical jazz and, and orchestrations. And it's funny because uh, orchestrators are, are the ones that love uh, orchestrators. <laughs> it was like nobody pays attention to this. You know, I just listen, I was listening to Jeremy Lubbock. It's a guy from South Africa. Mm. And he was a, a, a ranger's spring is here. To... When I, it, it's, it, I, I cry, you know, it's literally because I, there's nothing I can, that's, I want to be this guy now. I want to <laughs> write like this, right. you know. So I, I'm always trying to go in, in that direction. The beauty, it, it, not the money, not the rhythm, nothing matter. It, it's the, the beauty of it, to get emotional about it. And, and I learned from the Americans, from two those Canadians that I spoke about, <laughs> and classic music and the jazz player like Wes Montgomery, John Coltrane, my favorite guitar, Bill Evans. You know, my this is the guy. I have him in my my left side here in my heart. <laughs> and, you know, so uh, music for me is this. You know, and and then also the Brazilian guys like Jobim, my father, Adi Barroso, you know, those guys, they live in my heart, you know, so my music is this. Other than your parents passing away, were there any other points in your career where you felt um, that you you were going dry or that you're having a block? Yes, in the 80s, the middle of the 80s, uh, there was a, a wave of Brazilian rock and roll. So the space of other kind of music was kind of uh, down a little. And, uh, and for orchestrators like me and, and producers and stuff, it was really... Uh, so I, I went to the United States. I work uh, coming and going in 1990. And then we, we moved to... We moved to work for Quest Records that used to be to Quincy Jones. We uh, we invited by Luis Velasquez, uh, that was a CEO or something. Like that. And that uh, she called, she offered uh, this recording deal, and uh, and and then I, I Quincy was associated with the Warner at the time. They gave us the green card. And those, so the first 15 years in the United States was a bless. The, the 90 to, you know, and then became difficult musically for, for the music, you know. Oh, it's, it's not easy, but it's still steady. You know, I'm 77, but I still think that uh, the new generation is going to be uh, a chance to, to play their stuff. You know, there's a bunch of guys here. You, in Rio, Sao Paulo, in the northeast of Brazil, in the south. And uh, so, but I left Brazil because it was painful for me to stay, to, you know, to stay. So there, so I got in touch with the guys in uh, Dave Grusin. And so to be friends of Dave Grusin or Johnny Mandel, yeah. this is a bless, you know, it's like a, those are guys that are my heroes. I work with them. So it's it's so beautiful, and suddenly they they've asked me to sing in the, not him but Sidney Pollock at the end of the film called Havana. You know, if I don't know if you this one with uh, Robert Redford and uh, about the Cuban Revolution, mm. the start of the eight. So Dave Grusin wrote the the, the soundtrack. And I sang at the the end end title, but they never gave me credit because <laughs> uh, Pollock never told the union that I'm going to be singing, <laughs> so they never gave me credit for that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that kind of a, you know to to get in touch with that people that you you listen listening to you know so. I, I left the country and uh, I, I was so happy in, in America for 
you know, we had a beautiful life. Right. Yeah, my life. Uh, you were talking about something uh, a little earlier on uh, about when you came to America and you were uh, working. I forget who it was, but you said, oh, he was a nice guy. American musicians are nice to work with. Do you find that different cultures around the world, there's a different attitude of music or just an attitude with working with other musicians? No, in respect of, uh, because when they call me, they know what I am, what I do. So uh, those musicians, they work, you know, they work like with style or when they call me to do something for them, they know what kind of man I am, what kind of music I do. Uh, and, and there's some some stuff that <laughs> they're very funny. The other day, uh, a friend of mine brought uh, to Brazil uh, a group of Japanese people. This kid is a is a great singer, Renato Braz. It's a fantastic singer, and uh, he brought a, a group of Japanese to play in Brazil, and with them uh, a guitar player that was playing guitar exactly like me and better than me. You know, my chords, all my my things. And I used to record like a two or three guitars in the same cut with different sounds, you know. And he was mixing everything. So, but he played like, a, and I said, oh my God, you know, and he played all my songs. I play exactly better. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we went to a, a record and the funny thing, I'm not going to tell you the, 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 the end of the joke that I made, but it's funny because uh, he sat and I asked for a fish to eat. And he told the guys in Japanese, you see, I want the, this thing that he's, he asked, Dori, I want to eat the, this thing. So, okay. So the guy announced for, for the, the, I asked, uh, uh, the dessert, uh, something, and, and the guy says, I think that he's eating. I want to think that he's drinking. And I, finally, I told my wife, get out of here. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> uh. He wants everything that I do, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Take a cab and go home. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it's funny because if this happened in, in places like Japan or, or or other one day, you know, the way I play, you know, what kind of music and what kind of uh, musician I'm, I'm capable of. Being. So when they call me, they already know, you know, uh, what I'm, what, what I, what I do. So, or they like me for a reason. I don't know, but I never. So it's always a pleasant thing, with one exception that a. Uh, a singer in the United States called me to play with two very important musicians in business. Uh, one then uh, was the police, the group. He was the producer. And he asked me, uh, the girl asked me to play the guitar and because they wrote a bossa nova, which <laughs> in the beginning, it's a problem because the way that they, they see bossa nova yeah. It's a very American way to see bossa nova, and I play a different guitar. So I started to play, and then the bass player told me, "That's not the way that they play guitar in Brazil." And I said, "Well, I've been doing this for thirty-five years. <laughs> Nobody told me that. <laughs> now in Brazil, so." But and I said, "Then you know what? Keep the money, and uh, nice to meet you and see you and." Or somebody else. Actually, I called them called Charlie Bird, you know, and uh, <laughs> and I left. Uh. Be, it, those things sometimes happen when they don't know who you are or the music that you do. Well, the other thing I'm interested in, we were talking about this, and you briefly went over it. You had a quote. It was simple: "Save the forest." So. A lot of people don't understand what's going on in Brazil right now. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, they, they know, <laughs> you know. With Donald Trump and our president, I, I believe they know. The thing is, 
there's people uh, planting a lot of soy, dill, a lot of corn, and they spending their their land inside of reservations and you know looking for gold or, or to kill farms and stuff like that. And uh, this year we are we have we had the record of uh, burning stuff from from the, the entire north of Brazil, which is the Amazon and the Pantanal, which is a it's a life animal life paradise, you know. So uh, we still say, and we have to to say save the save the forest because uh, this new politicians in Brazil, those are the ones that, that are saying that the, 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 the world is round because it's a NASA thing. Because in, in reality, the world is flat. You know? So when you deal with any kind of people, you know, they're going to put the asphalt in the Amazon. That's the hope that they want to do. So for me, the most important thing is save the forest in the, right now. But, but lives matter. Too, because uh, it's getting violent. We have a lot of racism too in Brazil. It's a little disguise, but still we have. So things are very serious, and uh, we have to wait this, for this bunch of stupid people. There was, you know, when when the saliva falls from your <laughs> like you're drunk or something, and and you're Thai. And Nelson Rodriguez told the when this guy are <laughs> leaving saliva in their thighs and you know, something like that, you know. So they're gonna take care. They're gonna destroy the world. So they they want to play uh, like uh, also the ocean. We have uh, islands from five from the continents. It's called Fernando de Noronha. They want to make a Cancun, you know. It's a beautiful place. No people, almost no people, and you, to go there, you have to make a reservation. You have a, you know, now they they want to make a, a great Hawaii thing. So it's it's safe save the the Brazil from stupid people mostly. So the forest is the biggest uh, important uh, thing to save. That would make a great bumper sticker. Save Brazil from stupid people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I, I, I think I'm going to take this and use it in my car. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was going to say these are both two quotes. Save the forest, Black Lives Matter. And, uh, you know, sometimes we get on to uh, other quotes, but those are so important in today's society. So, yeah, thank you for sharing your views on that. Oh yes, I, you know it's necessary. After seventy-seven years, I never saw so many stupid people in the world. Right now, it's it's worse than that. Was thinking about it. It's terrible, mm -hmm. especially here in my country, in the United States, with with the, with this new government. You know, that owns the owns the field, the ball, and the team. You know, so there's nothing you can do because they think they, they run the world. You know, it's like a, a little Mussolini kind of uh, behavior, you know, mm. the guy. You know. mm. So uh, we live in that kind of, uh, it's not a, a di dictatorship, thanks God, but it's close. It's very close. You know, it's, it's stupid. You know, the people with the, the profile of uh, books in... <laughs> You know, in public places, you know, so you have to be very careful with that. So a lot of the times to get where you have to go, uh, we talk to everybody that comes on the podcast about this. Sometimes there's hurdles in your life that you have to overcome. You know, what were some of the hurdles that you had to overcome to become successful? Well, one of the things is the name of my father. <laughs> because he was, uh, when I started off the press, was saying, 
it's a junior, you know. <laughs> so I took I took a different way, you know, to orchestration and producing it, to avoid basically avoid the the criticism because they actually there was a, a international in Rio de Janeiro, the first one in '66. I won this festival, and the guy was saying that oh, okay, his father wrote the song. You know, it's like a, he doesn't know anything. It's it's a, it's a, he, probably his father wrote this song, and uh, so I there was that's probably the the uh, obstacle. The best one in my life. The rest, it's it's like a, you know music, just music, and uh, and I'm very happy with that. I be in the beginning for, and I had the chance to to be protect musically by Jordi, you know, and other guys, important guys from the music business. You know, I hate to call business, but that's the way it is. <laughs> yeah. I, I used to be a little radical about music business, you know. It's like a, I'm not business guy, but you know, I am, so I, I survive with music. So it's a, my business. Hmm. Anyway, right. I was protected. I was protected by important musicians, like I told you before, and uh, they cover, you know, and they tr- help me with uh, with this saying many times that I was a very talented guy, that I was this and that, nothing to do with my father. But it was complicated at the beginning. I have no trauma. <laughs> I was no, no, not really. <laughs> so let's switch it around. Uh, were some successful moments in your life, like top successes that you loved? In music, musically, I'm, I'm receiving back now uh, 60, 60 years of uh, musical life. I was 16 when I started. So uh, I was 17, but yeah, I'm 77. So, but in, you know, in musically, it's this. No, it, I, actually, I have a song called Like a Lover. It's the most recorded in the United States by many, many artists and, you know, but that was it. Yeah. So I'm not a famous guy. And uh, so musically, that's it. In my personal life, my wife, Elena, and I, without her, you know, I don't know how to, to, <laughs> to get on any computer or, 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 you know, I don't know how to pay bills, you know, with the cell phone, cell phone. You know, she helps me with that. So we're very happy in the mountains and uh, with the animals around, you know, a beautiful river behind the house. It's nice here. It's very nice. And it's a a great retirement. Still working. You know, this year I made more than 40 songs. Wow. Just just by looking to the, the poems of my... My part, Paulo says a Pinheiro. So I'm a happy guy, still working, you know, and uh, run to activate my brain. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna be, you know, uh, right now. I, I, I just wrote wrote a instrumental uh, arrangements for 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 a piano player friend of mine. Uh, and I'm, I have projects to to work with the, with the singers, and I have two albums too, you know. So I'm still working, and uh, the price the price that I have musically is that the some kids they they love me, so I'm very happy with that. They don't love my music, you know, so. Oh, very, very good. So Hayden. Last chance. Any more questions? I think that's that's all I got on my end. I have a little story to tell you about Canada because the first time that I went there, I fell in love with the country. We, we flew to, I think it's Montreal, there's in, in the East Coast. Yeah. yeah. And then we, we came crossing the country, Winnipeg, Saskatoon, Calgary, Alberta, you know, 
in those places, I don't know, it was like 40 below. And I was in a little restaurant, like a, a, a Thai restaurant. And uh, suddenly the guy called, went to my table and says, I think you, somebody stole your coat. <laughs> your, your co what do you call this? Coat. Uh, your coat. And I said, well, we are like a, probably 300 to 400 yards from the, the hotel. And I, I, said, oh, I, I walk. So the police guy that came to report, you know, to make no the, the, the stealing or something, he, he had a, a, a buffalo thing in his, in his head. You know? so, <laughs> I looked at the guys and I had like a three or four, you know, shots of Scots or something to walk. I, 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 Froze almost, you know. And the, the funny thing, it, it's like at two in the morning, somebody knocked at my door. It was two two police guys. Is this your coat? This is, yes. But, you know, I'm sorry. He's going to stay in Canada to, you know, as a, as a proof of the, the stealing. So goodbye. <laughs> I went back. No coat. Oh. <laughs> Oh, it, it went up in the in the two and to say, is this yours? Y yes, you see, but you know, not now. You give me your address, <laughs> and that was it. I never saw the coat anymore. I was so cold, man. It was so cold. <laughs> I, I I I put the bed up and I went, and I felt a lot of pain in 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 every every part of the the body. It's the worst thing that happened in Canada. The rest was beautiful. The country is beautiful, but it was white. It was winter time, yeah. so I couldn't see. But I know by by heart and by pictures and by movies that it's a beautiful country. I would I would live in that for sure. It's so beautiful in, in the summer, it's not not in the winter. <laughs> oh, exactly. Yeah, it's funny because uh, Sadao, you know Sadao Watanabe the. the Sadao Watanabe is a, is a sub player for, for Japan. I went there to play with him and uh, I told him, man, uh, this city, I can't remember the name of the city. I'm too old for that. But I told him, I would live here. So beautiful. And, and he told me, wintertime, very, summertime, very hot. <laughs> I That's gave like Canada. up. <laughs> 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 Just like Canada, yeah. But anyway, thank you guys for. It. I, I'm curious, how long to have this bird? You know, what what was that? This uh, your your car, Oh, the your, beard. Your, there, the beard. It's, how long uh, takes to have one like this? I want well, this. <laughs> uh, this would have taken about two two and a half years, but I burnt it off. I burnt all of this making hamburgers. <laughs> so it, it's finally come back. I, I It was kind of like this before, because all of this in here burnt. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. Oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, thank you guys very much for the opportunity. Hey, we, we had a, a pleasure. It was an honor to, to speak with you. And uh, usually at the end of the podcast, we ask our guest, do they know a person? You know, do they know a guy? Do you have anybody that you could recommend to come on to the podcast? This is Scott. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and my wife is it's voting for Scott, uh, one saxophone player in the, in the United States. A very good arranger and singer. It's a beautiful guy. And okay. he is interested in Brazilian music too. I just record a Brazilian samba with him, and uh, by this miracle of the <laughs> internet, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> that would be perfect if you could make the introduction. What's his name? Scott Scott Mayo Mayo. I like the clinic. Yeah, I like, I like the, the Mayo Clinic. Say my wife. Ah, okay, got it. <laughs> Scott Mayo. It, it, he. He's a, he's a very musical, incredible, 
incredible arranger. I'll send them. Yeah, Elena can send you the, the whole information about him. And he, he's very knowledgeable about Brazilian music too, if it, if it helps. Perfect. Well, that this sounds fantastic. And we have to say thank you to Helena too, because behind the scenes, she got you onto the internet. <laughs> Yes, yeah, true. And she helps me with the English too, because uh, <laughs> I, I was living in making music and uh, my contact with the Americans were very limited. And, and she worked for, for them for six or seven years in, in, with jewelry and stuff like that. So she speaks fluent English, you know. I'm a, I'm a disaster. <laughs> I don't think so. You did perfect. Uh, what kind of musician your son is? Uh, tell me uh, what kind of music he plays, what, what the instrument. Uh, so I'm primarily a double bass player, uh, but I play piano, guitar, electric bass as well, and primarily jazz. Jazz? Yeah, primarily, but I also, I do play rock. Uh, and I've actually, it's funny, I've recorded two albums with Brazilian musicians. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, more more in like Brazilian jazz uh, kind of fusion. Yeah, it's nice from you to to play rock and roll at mm -hmm. least to make some money. This is true. <laughs> I wish you a, a great career in your life of, of musician. You know, I hope you can play stuff that you like and stuff imposed by industry or something like that. Yeah, I try to, but thank you. Like I, like I say, Sam, you guys behave yourself. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, Dory. Well, thank you so much again, and uh, you have a great evening. Thank you, you too, my friend. Thank yeah. you very much. That concludes our interview with Dory Kaimi. Make sure to tune in next week for our interview with Ian Thompson, who is a British author. He's written such books as The Dead Yard, Tales of Modern Jamaica, and Primo Levi, The Elements of Life, and of course, many, many, many more. We end up touching on the importance of great and poor teachers, along with his writing process and research tactics that I certainly wouldn't try today. <laughs> That's enough for me, and I'll see you next time.